From Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Okay, here we are again with Adam and Kate in another episode of All Things Science Fiction. And I was just um, I was just going to apologize, almost just kind of playfully, uh, to Adam about not letting him in as fast enough. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, he's probably, I can almost see what he's thinking. He's like, it was fast enough, dude. You don't need to, it was fine. Right? <laughs> But, you know, when you get that indication on your computer, you're, you're drawn to it very quickly, right? And so just like we listen to things in a, um, a, a Skype call or even this particular call, there's a certain amount of latency that happens that we don't perceive, yeah. right? Like we can have a, a coherent conversation with a little bit of like technological adaptation, right? So we'll we'll pause a little bit more to let, you know, um, let somebody speak. Do you know what I mean? But there's aspects of the conversation that really already, you know, filter into um, an ethology of where we watch how people conversate. And there's a point where I'm going to pause like right about now. And then it somewhat passes the baton on to somebody. Now I realize that I haven't completed my, uh, you know, my full explanation of why I was being so delinquent and irresponsible with letting Adam in so fast. But again, I'm going to pass it over to the two of you to just tell me how your day's going. <laughs> my day's going awesome. And actually, you brought up a really interesting point, Dan, because Kayla and I actually got into this conversation, I can't remember whether yesterday or last week or whatever, about latency with communication. So, in, you know, this idea of communicating in the future, interplanetary, you know, what are you going to do about the lag, the speed of light? And, you know, there's different kinds of communication, right? We want to bring entanglement into the mix for instantaneous communication. Um, what we landed on is that we need uh, some expertise here to uh, try and guide us in terms of um, things like security uh, of information, right? You might want to send information one way or a different way, depending on how long you want to wait, how secure it has to be. Etc. 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 et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. So, so if we could get Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory to come on our show. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be, be awesome. <laughs> well, you know, I want to reveal some bias here, at least with the quantum, the quantum theory. Um, to summarize, uh, well, the, the, um, the, the entanglement transmission between entanglement. The yeah. one, right? Mm-hmm. So my fundamental bias here is that um, I've developed or sketched out, and we call it a pre-theory, right? And so basically what I've done is I've, I've said that our issue has to do with the, the size of the Euclidean point. Now, I understand this is a fictitious idea. Size of what? <laughs> the what? The Euclidean <laughs> point. Ooh, I don't even know what that is. Well, okay, so there's Euclidean <laughs> mathematics, right? And so you know what it sounds like. <laughs> well, okay, so I'll give you a, a real brief overview. Okay, so Euclidean mathematics is what everything is built on. And as engineer, this is really interesting because I would be able to say something to you guys and say, you know, do you know what the um, such and such coefficient is for estimating, you know, some sort of benchmark of whatever, right? You'd be like, yeah, mm-hmm. I absolutely know lots of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So th- this is the kind of, you know, some of the things that happen in engineering. But that what I'm, my point is, is that the foundation of all mathematics, at least our Western sense of mathematics, is from Euclid. Uh, he was an ancient mathematician that basically ah. ag- aggregated all of these, you know, mathematical concepts, um, in primarily in, in geometry. Right. So he's the one that defined the point point in space, right, is a unique entity, undefined um, axiom of mathematics, right? And so my thinking about quantum physics is that we're on a little bit of a a dead-end dendrite. Um, I'm really Einsteinian in terms of deterministic outcomes, 
all this spookiness at a distance stuff, I'm not really, I don't really subscribe to. I'm not saying that the novel has to go in any particular way that's, you know, my trajectory. I'm just saying that I want to reveal a bias that I, I think the, uh, the work, the research to be done is actually um, mapping the observable universe and the photons onto uh, a, uh, a mathematics that takes into account a defined point. Um, and in, and sort of like an innate probability to the to the nature of that point. Okay. So that's you know that's where I would go with the thing. I, w- I do want to let you know that, and I've uh, first of all I got to come back to my my latency with letting Adam in. It's a little bit of a phenomenon just how we can actually communicate th- in this. So it's like what information is in the um, in the space between the dec- discrete jumps. Right, so I'm conveying information, but in an analog signal, it, that's fine. Our perception only receives it in chunks, right? Mm-hmm. Sort of thing, right? And these are kind of like you know what we reconcile concepts and stuff off of. So this led me to the uh, uh, to something that I had explained to Kate when she did the the voiceover for today's episode, right? Um, I made a mistake. <laughs> I took I, I took her voiceover and I recorded it to the next one. Oh, <laughs> hey, let's see if it works. <laughs> well, no, I mean, and, and, and for all intents and purposes, and here's the point where I want to, uh, you guys, I'm, you're with me 100, percent right, Kate? You're, do you understand yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah. So far, I got that. Because this is going to be key because I'm I'm actually trying to storyboard something for you, a different kind of psychology in the in the like in the, in the science fiction book. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll watch this episode, okay? And I'll pause and point out a few points, okay? Which was just completely incorrectly done. Right? Just completely incorrectly done, okay? okay. Mine, uh, mine was completely incorrectly done? Well, <laughs> your voice. You there was no wrong answers. <laughs> no, 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 there, no, there isn't. You, this, you might, right. be, you Pandora, might be opening up Pandora's Pandora. box here. So this is all I'm saying is we may have stumbled upon the most epic accident ever in terms of okay okay Okay. so here's let's do it okay so all right i'm leaving it on because we can capture face expressions but okay we'll play it right now Are you like Wells, believing that anything is possible in the realm of science fiction? If you can imagine it, then it can be. Perhaps it doesn't matter that you cannot explain how it came to be. Or are you a Vernian, needing to have scientific foundation on all projected imaginary futures? Okay, there's a pause there for a minute. You can see it's not syncing up with the narration, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for all intents and purposes, we could dismiss this as something that is just an error of, of lining things up, right? Right. Yeah. So the idea here is a little bit, it's building on this concept of free form association. Remember when I removed myself from the, um, the exercise of saying, here's the set of images. Now, without thinking about what I'm thinking of, just right. through free form association, come up with kind of your own learning journey, right? Sort of thing, mm-hmm. okay? So we have another parallel track running with something that is, you know, from another, uh, you know, from another database, right? Which is essentially represented here in this one that doesn't quite match. So the idea is, is that the, the listener can take these two seemingly unconnected concepts and see if there is anything that logically makes sense between Sir Francis Bacon and uh, I can't remember the thinker that Kate was referring to, right? Wells or Vernian? Or, uh, yeah, and the Vernian, right? He started with Wells and then went into uh, in, into Bill right, right, exactly. So here's the thing. Now I, I would say, what would be the purpose of doing this, right? But I want you guys to think <laughs> about how we <laughs> how we do narrative story and string, right? How we string together narratives and concepts. 
And the leading intellectual and philosophical thought has to do with how do we, at the source, change how we're actually thinking? Like, you know, kind of expand how we're thinking abstractly, right? And so this is something that I'm really interested in, in terms of, um, you know, what goes on at Planxit, right? In terms of, you know, how do you create this breeding ground of, of new thought? Well, you have to have less end-to-end editorial sort of direction and, and give people maximum amount of creative freedom, right? This is how you have to do that. And so then we say, well, why would we limit ourselves to two tracks in this particular exercise? And I would say it would be really interesting if psychologically we thought as follows. We're not only trying to fit the world into how we see it, we are constantly trying to bring in that alternative. Now, the dangers in lie with the alternatives, I think, that are mapped onto pleasure pain sensitive um, uh, responses. It makes our society metaphysically more abrasive to things that really are not, don't have harm. Right? Like we don't want to do anything that instigates harm in terms of speech, right? But we can't yeah. limit speech. So essentially what this does is it has people think in um in 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 a in, in a broader spectrum, right? A- allowing yourself to you know build uh theoretical concepts um in uh, like several of them instead of just one particular narrative. Okay. Yeah. So now the novel itself would have to, it would have to kind of elucidate and make that kind of like part of the light motifs or the threads throughout the thinking. Cause you're making a, like a philosophical statement about not just like linear, um, like storytelling. Right. Mm-hmm. So, and then what happens is that the book could take advantage of some of that just on how you write the book, right? So it just becomes this whole like expression in itself. The the danger in lies is that, you know, if you go too far away from the norm, you run into trouble because it becomes so esoteric that, you know, people just can't grab it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's probably the point of the conversation. And as a, you know, uh, a fellow thinker in this book, I mean, ultimately the direction is your guys's, but I thought that that's an interesting Uh, like precursor to at least a conversation. Okay. Yeah, I dig it. I'm always up for uh, cool ideas. So I don't know. I'm imagining like we could build on this wakening scene where, you know, it's wakening, but wakening into what, you know, like it'd be really interesting to see that there's this, this, you know, mechanical best friend that kind of helps you through the day sort of thing. I don't know. Right. Or serves up the information and you can respond to it. I don't know. We can like, it's just, it's just really interesting to build a new, like a different type of environment. Right. Well, you just gave me a cool idea, Dan. <laughs> Better play the rest of the video. Then I'll, then I'll share. Do the right video. Kate, where are you on the scale? Just like want to gauge you with what you're, I'm processing still, but okay. I, I like that Adam and I had a, a chat about like having this like constant feed of information given to you and the bias in that and the filters that have to be put into that in order to present you what, what, what the system thinks is the right information for you to make the right choices. Right. And what, so what am, and the, the thing is, is if it's totalitarian, because it's one, if it comes out with two, and they're abstract enough that they're not they're not put together. The, the, the system, it's decentralizing that totalitarian. If you see that this accident, the way it happened, was that I had no planning on putting this to the incorrect person. But what you do is you put like two arbitrary information streams of instructions that have maybe they're kind of mapped onto two different sort of timescales. I would say right. that would be really interesting. And I think we naturally do that. Some people are long-term thinkers and other people are short-term thinkers, right? And so some of the problems that we encounter have to do with temporal, uh, like, um, emphasis. Certain people emphasize certain, uh, you know, things uh, that are kind of more proximal or distal, closer or further away from them, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
we, we see this in climate change. There you go. I weaved it in again. You guys, geez, you know, like get it in there, right? And I go, there's this climate change thing. And this is very long term, even to the point where it's past generations. It could be like, you know, at what point could we say, you know, it doesn't matter if the whole, you know, species it, it expires seven generations from now. Who cares? Like, who gives a shit? Mm. It would probably be good for the planet. The sooner the better, right? <laughs> like, can you have that conversation? Is it a valid, defensible position? It's a simple one to articulate. Okay. Does it so go you, against humanity? Right. Okay, that's a long term. That you're talking about the long term message, or and sh versus short term, which is like, what are we doing right now? For that's right. Climate change. But then, how are you tying this whole climate change thing back to this? Like, two pieces of information. Like, one is like. I get it. One is like going 700 years and one's going 40 years. Well, we want to get, the theme is we want to introduce a framework, but we want to maximize creativity. And so we kind of think about how do you do that? Right. So until now, like any kind of centralized planning or social construction, you know, has, has to do with um, like forcing ideas. Right. And so we don't want that. And so I'm trying to imagine a society where there's like guardrails, right? Suggested guidelines or whatever. You don't go against anything that you don't think, but to say like, here's kind of how we agree how to counterpoint and build your critical thinking is build, you know, two basically competing narratives. And the thing is to say, well, so where do we draw our substrate from? Well, we can randomly serve it up to you and you have to kind of put it together. And then from a big data standpoint, we can, you know, we can basically monitor our godlike health sort of thing, right? Yeah, I get it. And then the same sort of like mechanical God becomes revealing because it's like, he spoke to me, but he actually did. He sent me an email. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so weird, but it's like my spam folder. I don't know what it is, but God's emails goes constantly to my spam folder. <laughs> That's right. But I, you know, I, I don't know what it is. It's like the, um, you know, it's, this would be somewhat of an, uh, like an embracement of, of the, uh, the Adam, what do you call that? When you transhumanism, like where you're moving into the machine, it's like, but I'm saying, no, we just open. That's cool. <laughs> like it's, it's not like I go in for an operation and I have like our species is moving there. It doesn't hurt me. There's well, no suffering. A lot less. Like, here's where my brain is going with this. So as we exist now, right, we go about our day, we take in information, we process it, we react, we behave in a certain way. And that happens very much, you know, sh straight line, one thing after the another, there's no changing that. Our physical reactions respond immediately following our, you know, surroundings and input and experience. If we imagine this, this virtual world where part of our brain is living and playing, even maybe while we're sleeping, can we diverge those a little bit? Could there be a narrative where I'm physically doing this, that, or the other thing, but like subconsciously or part of my brain is doing something totally different? So the like input streams separate somewhat. So for example, yeah, it's being eating me. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. What did you say, Kate? I my missed life. that. It's, I said it's called being ADHD. Welcome to my life. There you go. Right. So that's a superpower. And what I thought was this whole idea of the awakening scene, right? We were thinking of it very, um, you know, like our own experience in getting up in the morning. But like we could write half the book uh, in terms of like this happening, engaging, talking, blah, 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 and then switch it over and say, oh, yeah, that's why he was sleeping. Now he's waking up. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, shit, you guys. I just thought of the most perfect advertisement kind of funny thing. We we flip woke on the on its head, right? Because the other usually it's a pejorative to say woke, yeah. but in, in this dystopian or you know utopian universe, <laughs> being so woke is actually cool. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We need your book. Well, right. So, so you have this woke sort of like we're kind of poking fun at it in a way, but it's like 
I imagine so much of the story, like Adam said, could be written where it's like, well, my body doesn't get up for another 45 minutes. So um, <laughs> it's like, you, you know, you, you, I don't know, transcend the substrate that we were in, in a, uh, like a, in a dream state. And it's I like. Know. Squirrel, squirrel moment. Are you ready? <laughs> I was like yesterday day old when I realized that transcend was trance end. Yep. Okay. And, and not just the word transcend. I didn't realize that it was like the ending of a trance. It was like yesterday that that was like brought to my attention. And okay. I. That's today for me. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Mm. but okay. you can really have some fun with this stuff you know like the whole idea of inception right if you're playing with this type of stuff and you've got dream within a dream within a dream right we can do all sorts of things you know what is awakening but, but the thing is adam it's like why not just bifurcate it let's just keep it at two this is one of our propensities is to take things and extrapolate it so far you're right about transcendence right but you're showing kind of like that infinite regress in abstract thought sort okay. of thing, right? Where I'm saying is it's like one tiny step and just go from one to two. Okay. And and it's like if you want to if you want to transcend humanity, right? You have to say, well, what would be infinite, especially if you can't put a limit on what humanity is what would be infinitesimally ideal is to replicate something and observe it, right? Like, it's like you have one version of you and the other version of you, but yeah. rather than making them e good and evil, right? Maybe a little bit of reference to Nietzsche's beyond good and evil, but the idea is is, is that transcending that, that um, right-wrong dichotomy is that it's more like A-B, a, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, right? And they're all pointed in the same direction, mm. right? Of eliminating um, suffering, right? We want a homogeneic state where we can thrive, right? Just like, you know, workplace environment that we talked about earlier in the week, right? With ENTA. But, mm. you know, what are those ideal conditions? And I think some infinite possibility comes in when when somebody can integrate the single biggest um, advantage that we have as a species. And we could say opposing thumbs, we can say, you know, upright status to be able to look and perceive the world. And they all developed, you know, together, but we have this two and three quarter pound brain with this, this like literally unimaginable ability to abstract. There's no, like, you know, we have this, like, free universe to explore and romp around in. Okay. Right? And so this, this ability to abstract the way we have, coupled with how we are as humans with, like, a you social capability, gives us this, such an amazing ability to be able to, you know, do what humans uniquely do. And I think in the future with the sci-fi um, it has to stay true to that. I mean, we we want to accentuate what we can do with our imagination, right? It's, I guess, the difference between utopian or dystopian kind of directions, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, what if you could run a simulation, like, in your own mind of, of doing something? So, I don't know, you're imagining in a scenario that's going to happen today, a conversation with someone you know, could you simulate it in your own head and it probabilistically predict what will probably or might happen and then contrast that to actually executing what actually happens? So, I mean, that people do that already, but they just yeah. don't have the data input to overlay to it, right? Like yeah. people are constantly like, well, what if I said this? I wonder if that would happen. And people like play out scenarios. There's, and in fact, some people live more in that zone than they do other places, right? And they're like, some people are present. Some people live in the future where they're constantly playing over these what ifs. And some people live in the past, which is like, I should have done, right? So people already do that. But what if you could now overlay statistical data to help them get to a better outcome, right? So it's like, 
yeah, you just what if that, but the probability of that what if is like 0.2%. Oh, now I can erase that. Well, what if this? Okay, the probability of that is now 20%. Oh, okay. Right? Would you be more apt to live in that what if state? Like, how would you ever get out? Yeah. Look, and I, I think I really advocate for that type of thing. And you say, well, this is this really something like really bizarre or too far out there? And guys, I want to tell you, it's here right now. We, 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 we go to a medical system. We in Canada have an like fairly decent medical system, I guess. You know, because we, you know, it's not all out of pocket. There's a, a socialist aspect to it that isn't scary for all of okay. the American people listening. Fairly, fairly good in fine, like as from the end user from a financial standpoint. Well, let's caveat what fairly good means. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, I I, I agree. Okay, Adam, do you agree with that? I concur. <laughs> okay. Okay. Without get, we could have a whole episode on healthcare, but let's not go there, right? Yeah. So, so the idea is that if you have a doctor, the doctor says, "Well, you know, the, you know, sometimes they give you the morbid extreme. You know, there is a chance anytime you take the anesthetic, a uh, 0.2 percent chance that you might not wake up or something like this, right? Yeah. Um, so doctors use a lot of differential diagnosis and, you know, for, for diagnosis and then trying to, um, you know, kind of weigh the difference between treating symptoms in some situations or trying to be preemptive. And there's a lot of extenuating circumstances like age and health and, you know, what your, the state of your immune system is at and all this kind of thing. So Kate's absolutely right. We do it a lot. And in, in a profession that is so tied to our suffering, like hospitals, um, we realize that this this ideal and this concept of do no harm is really, you know, I, I think a really a good model, right? And so, you know, we can imagine a world where there's more of that type of analytics freely available, you know, t in society, right? But I think there's trouble lurking there because everyone has their own risk profile, right? People, human brain does not understand probability very well. You know, even people who study it as, as their whole career, you know, you could say, oh, yeah, there's a 2% chance. But then you apply that same probability to, I don't know, your kids. And all of a sudden, there's an emotional response. So I feel as though you could overlay that data on, but in terms of a system feeding people information, it would just have to be, you should do this. You should do that. It would have to hide all of that. Because some people, a hundred percent is not good enough, but there's not there's nothing hundred percent in life, right? You know, so yeah, I think you got to be careful because uh, giving people too much information would just paralyze them. So, and I want to add to that. So, you were talking before about like the bumper lanes, right? Like, mm -hmm. here's the parameters which you could operate in, and you like be a massive bounce in between kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, yeah. okay, we'd have to set some parameters around like do no harm. Well, look at our medical system right now. Like, do no harm isn't what is best, mm. right? Like, we are on a very reactive medical system. We, and it's like, and it's funded. It's funded to be reactive. I will give you a very real example story, right? Like, I have to take thyroid medication every day. And I said, like, why am I taking this? Like, why hasn't anybody solved this problem? Like, and there's literally like a, one in three people that I talk to are taking thyroid medication. We pay for it every month. And yes, it's covered by the benefits to go through the system and everybody gets their little piece of the pie, but nobody's solving the actual problem or, or investing in solving the problem because everybody's getting paid. Yeah. No one cares that I've got to put a foreign substance in my body every day and what possible outcomes are in that. Future yeah. them problem, future money problem, or or benefit for them, you know. <laughs> Perhaps. Almost like you feel like a little bit of that planned obsolescence that happens in products, right? We just become products and mm -hmm. and uh, a, a symbiotic carrier of their profits, right? And it, again, it feels so. Yeah, it's uh, <sighs> ugly. Yeah, well, economics rules, right? You want to change the world, you got to understand the the economics at play and learn to work. Within, with it, yeah, because you know, you're not with it. Yeah, you know, this whole idea of something trying to decide for you what to do, 
you know, think about autonomous vehicles. One of the struggles right now is the philosophy of what they're supposed to do. Is a car that's self-driving, you know, if it comes across a scenario where it's going to crash and, you know, kill four people in the car or it's going to swerve and hit someone else and kill one, like it's the whole train problem. What's, it is. What, what are you supposed to program the car to do, right? Like what is, you know, so you, you're kind of stuck with these philosophical um, but this is why I love this. This is why philosophy and, and science is like where they get tied together. You can't escape it. And when we're talking about transcendence and futurism and all this kind of stuff, you can't help but choose the philosophy one way to help guide you in, in what's going to happen. So, well, okay. and this, and this is really the problem with AI is that it's still programmed by humans that have bias. Right. Yeah. And so like you look at and I, I have a friend, um, Paulo Crutney, who is who is uh, doing some very, really amazing like app development in the AI area. And he did a study using one of his his softwares that he built that like the AI bias in Google. Like when you do a Google search. Right. Mm -hmm. So and it was around gender. Right. And so it was things like, if you look up the word woman, what are the next following pieces? So that's, that's AI taking and scraping the internet to find the next most valuable pieces of searches relevant on other people's. So you're inputting bias every day into a system to create AI because it's fed by humans. And so it was amazing to see the bias in words. And mm -hmm. it was like, this study was just crazy is because how are we going to create an AI that's going to help us if we can't eliminate our own bias? Uh, Kate, I think the philosopher in me wants to, I mean, you definitely have bias towards the word bias, right? Which is fine, but put, put a, a different flavor on it and see, um, could that word be represented in a, di I'm, I'm kind of leading you down a path, but I, th the word could be represented in a different word that actually would say that this is um, uh, what makes us human, right? So we, we don't want to systematically erase our bias because this this actually has an, uh, an evolution, evolutionary adaptive function is for us to, you know, gravitate towards one particular mode of, of thinking, right? So, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a big stretch there, right? But I just, you know, before we take the eraser out and try and develop a system that, I guess, well, I very... Can, I think this is where we can play a little bit, right? Like the whole premise of our book is that you plug into a system that tries to control the information and guide you in the system. But when, I mean, when you unplug, then you're, you have nothing but your humanity to rely on. And I think that is somewhere we want to play and contrast in our story. Right. So this is a perfect That's really place good. Okay. to talk about stuff like this. Right. right. I'm unplugged. I don't know. It doesn't tell me what to do. What does my gut tell me? I should do this. Right. Oh, uh, you know, I mean, if you had a system telling you probability and chance, we'd have no entrepreneurs. <laughs> They'd say, you're out of your freaking mind. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we're going to write this book. We're going to write this book twice. Just, yeah. <laughs> alert. Alert. Do not proceed. Do not proceed. <laughs> yeah. So I think that you've just kind of hit a, a really cool concept that I really love to play in there. This whole concept of humanity, bias, ad adaptivity, and then connection. And then what happens when you you kind of use those gifts in, in kind of the natural way without these augmented systems trying to influence you. So, so I know this is a topic for, for Monday with Enta, just put this on the to-do list, is like the gut feel oh, yeah. driving business. So go ahead and put that on the talk list because we could talk about that for an hour and how that, like, people have eliminated that, right? They rely on data. They Google search. They go right away. They don't. And I'm, I'm reading the book Limitless, which is about removing all of the digital flow of information to be able to actually process again mm -hmm. using your your the way you feel using your brain making yourself actually think about what's my opinion not what's everybody's opinion and what you know i'll mash them all together and pick this one right kate i have a question for you here i think if there's viewers out there that are like me 
I'm drawn to this background you have. Now, the, the reason is, is that this background to me, I can't tell entirely what it looks like, but it, it, it looks like a mixture between a Russian TARDIS and a Land Rover or some sort of like spacecraft or something. What is that there? It is a broken time machine stuck somewhere in June 6, 1966. Holy shit. Okay. What is that? The flex capacitor on the side there? <laughs> no, that's just a handle to climb up in. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you have to play my you have to play my real clip. Yes, Don't we're going to do that right now. It's like you're reading my mind. She traveled into the future. She realized that I was just pressing play, right? Yeah. And here we are. Hold on a second. Uh. How did I do that? Okay. Um, talks amongst yourselves, please, because this is going to take <laughs> at least 35% of my brain power, and that yeah, doesn't yeah. require a shift in content and focus. Sorry. Let's, uh, we'll keep talking about the bias in technology. <laughs> no, okay. it's, a, it's a really interesting point, though, Dan, that you bring up is like, and, and we didn't really touch on it, but you talked about. Um, oh, you, like, don't remove bias. What happens when a bias conflicts with that golden rule that you now set? Do no harm. Now what happens? Right? Like, you can't, we, if, these biases are in conflict with some of our golden rules. And at what point do they, uh, you know, send an error to the system? Well, you know, you know, you have to look no further than Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, right? That's exactly mm -hmm. what that's talking about. And, you know, there, there's a whole series of stories written on, like, <laughs> how that can go go bad. Like, oh, here we go. But right. I do want to hear more about Asimov's um, laws, right? There's uh uh, he's a really important figure. We should we could do a whole episode about that, right? Yeah. What are the three O laws? Do you remember? It's like you cannot hurt a human. You cannot. Oh, I can't remember what they are. I can, I can't either. Actually, I haven't. I have not read any. Actually, and I might people might be waving their their finger, but I mean, this for, for some reason haven't. This oh, year might be the, the year. <laughs> I've read The Foundation. I did that, read that years ago, but I don't know if I've read the iRobot series because I know there's a bunch of them. Right, right. Okay, so we'll play this one uh, now. Are you like Wells, believing that anything is possible in the realm of science fiction? If you can imagine it, then it can be. Perhaps it doesn't matter that you cannot explain how it came to be. Or are you a Vernian, needing to have scientific foundation on all projected imaginary futures, with no possibility of changing the laws of physics? Are you certain we have discovered and understood all there is to know upon which we can base an imaginary world? Do you think Jules Verne could have possibly envisioned the world we have today. Are we so arrogant to think we have it all figured out? Perhaps the materials or mechanisms in which this imagined reality has evolved from are yet to be discovered. Do you think the currently unexplainable phenomenon of the quantum world will have no significant weighting? on our future world? Do not limit me. Do not put me in Schrodinger's box. For my imagination is well alive and will not be limited to the things I think I already know. There are epic things coming and it will cause a sensation across the nation, across the galaxies, this one will be for the history books, for the future history books, or data files for that matter. For our biggest limitation is our belief that something is impossible. Break through the barriers of our beliefs and we could even break through 
the barriers of time. Now, just imagine what we could do then. Let's hope we do the right thing. Goosebumps. Nice job. That nice was thank you. <laughs> and a Schrodinger reference in there. Just, <laughs> like that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but I want to throw the, the opposite perspective that works both ways on the Schrodinger scenario, right? Because I understood where you're going with the Schrodinger piece, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think as mainly from a humanities understanding of let's base this off of this cat in a box narrative type of thing. Right now, the alternative is, is that I, I could embrace that cat in the box thing, but put a different um, sort of interpretation to it and say that, you know, the cat can be both alive and dead, depending on what you look at. Right. Depending on your perspective. Right. So mm -hmm. you could actually make the case that it's a uh, it's it's um, it, it's a way to show our probabilistic outcome of being both on and off. Wasn't it uh, Einstein that said, God does not play dice? Yes, that's right. There's no probability. And I, I, I side more towards that, right? But you see what I said earlier in the, in the podcast, I basically said, like, one of the things I do as a philosopher, I didn't, this is kind of, I didn't say this, but this is what I do, is I look at things and I try and run, you know, two competing narratives in my mind, right? I mean, sometimes I think we can actually do up to seven, but instead of falling into your guardrails, right? Like Kate had said, you build them to make them really strong. You try and make a competing argument really strong, as strong as you can make it. Mm -hmm. And so now you start to see the spectrum of possibilities that open up to you rather than entrenching your own bias into, into a trajectory that is, um, you know, quite possibly destructive to yourself, right? And I think what Kate was explaining earlier is that, quite in fact, that's what we do very naturally by analyzing, you know, our brain is a meat of, of computational what ifs and, you know, a probability calculators, I think Steven Pinker called it. Uh, I, I think it's a, a really cool notion. Like, you know, in the narrative Kaylin just did, like, I remember reading that in the late 1800s, you know, Newtonian physics it, it kind of well understood. And it, there was some sentiment that, uh, you know, that we might be done. We got it, you know, and then bang, relativity comes along and totally like destroys that. And then not long after this idea of quantum physics and then, you know, <laughs> like 11 dimensional string theory later on after that. So this, this whole idea of, you know, um, you cannot even imagine where where we're going because right, right? <laughs> that sky's the limit. You know, that Wells versus Wells is Vern. I think it's a really cool concept, right? You wanted to know what the ass man's three laws of robotics were? <laughs> yes. Did you Google it? <laughs> yeah, I did. It's ass uh, moms. <laughs> I was just yeah. being facetious yeah. I know I liked it I was going to give you a thumbs up hey if we can't ask for a thumbs up at, or if we can ask for a thumbs up at any time I think that's a pretty genuine one so right. viewers that should be the point where you <laughs> thumbs up the video right yeah and we can see that because we can see a spike I think if we look at analytics which we rarely do but you can actually I think look that at timestamp such and such yeah. there was a whole lot of thumb likes on there right all right, let's like the ass man's robotic laws. Okay, here we go. <laughs> a robot may not injure a human being through, okay. uh, through action or inaction. It may not allow a human being to come to harm. And it may not, and it must obey the orders given unless the orders conflict with the first law. There you go. So we, that's the problem that we're having, right? Like, what if the choice is injure one or injure four, right? Like, or or if you take an action, it injures them. If you don't take an action, it injures them, right? Like, now you're getting into this, um, like, probability of depth of injury and depth of, like, okay, what is more, what do we consider to be more traumatic? 
right? This, this concept of like, what's an acceptable injury? What's not an acceptable injury? Like that, how do you program that in? How do you decide as a human? How do we decide as an insurance company, how much somebody's life is worth? But they do, they put a number to everything. But anyway, yeah. that's the problem is that it comes into conflict with itself on, on a number of occasions, right? And scenarios, Adam, I think is the concept. Mm-hmm. like there's a space to play there a little bit yeah. i know I, I left it on purpose viewers yeah. this was the this is what is not said in the space <laughs> right yeah. you know what do you think adam the entire world is in your hands and what you decide right like what if you had to make a decision right now mm. We're all looking to Adam. He's the, well, he was the progenitor of all humans, right? I mean, right. Um, and, you know, Kate was just a rib. So, I mean, that's if we're looking at it from a Christian sense, I suppose, right? I suppose. So. Just a rib. Just Give me that out. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to turn to the, to the matrix, right? Humanity uh, rules all, right? At the end of the day, he chose his own unique perspective, which was love over the greater good. I guess one of powerful know. driver, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the what if side of that, you know, does Neil go through the other door? I don't know. Maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't matter. This is what happened. Here we are. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm leaving you there uncomfortably pausing, right? Like, it's yeah. like, I want you to just say something. Just leaves no. me squirming out here on the end of this line. <laughs> Sometimes you got to squirm. <laughs> it's like the, the writing process can be hor horrific at times, right? It's mm -hmm. like, God, yeah. So back well, to the writing, start to actually like, structure some of this stuff out in the first few chapters you told us to get some like key points of what happened through the journey yeah and so we have started structuring some of this out which has been a good fun conversation and i think adam and i had some of these in-depth conversations of like well we talked about um entanglement theory which you know could solve could be one way to solve the communication problem of distance across galaxies um and so once that was solved up to that point, you know how you said you can like get a foundation and then wave a wand. We were like really good with that good combination. Like here's a theory that could probably work and it doesn't matter how they solved it. They, solved it. <laughs> um, you know, and if we have an expert come in an entanglement theory who can build on it, Hey, great. If we don't, we'll have to just use the wand. Right. And that's, that's fine with us. But one of the things that we talked about and we've we've been all over the map a little bit here today but we talked about healthcare and this was the problem that our character has so he has in previous episodes he you sleep three hours a day tops right because you go automatically into REM through the system you're chipped in okay our character and for all intents and purposes he's going to be referred to we decided as a they we talked about gender last time so they, uh, then they, they're, he's going to, I'm going to say he, cause that's just what I automatically do. So, um, anyway, he shuts down, they shut down their sleep cycle to say, nope, an emergency came up. I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to skip this one. He skips eating and he skips. So we all know that the human body cannot skip sleep cycles, right? It enters like a state of psychosis and you eventually will die. Right. So he ends up having a very traumatic um, experience. And we also talked about healthcare now in this society is because of all the series of pandemics and the way people are living. And, and now healthcare is like, we got you, but you have to follow our rules. Like when we give you a prescription, you got to do what we say. So he has an episode, he breaks down, he gets a um, essentially a prescription to say like, you need to, uh, go to a reset center and get 
caught up back into work confident that you're back onto your proper nutrition sleep cycles, essentially, is what he has to do. So this whole setting scene, he wakes up and it's kind of like this quick blissful moment, but nothing really that he's tapping into, right? It's all generated for him, this sunrise thing. And then it's just like a series of shit shows (laughs) that are taking over his life between his kid, between, um, I'll get better at this between their kid, between the, their, um, like work is having security breach. It's having, and one of the things we talk about, this is so cool. I'm going to let you talk in a second. Hang on. (laughs) One of the things we talked about is that litigation in the business world is literally a click of a button and all the data is immediately brought forward. And through the AI system, it's uh, point rebuttal, point rebuttal, point rebuttal, and it just gets processed up to a point and then it, and it just gets like a human stamp and then sentence. That's it. So like it, it, it's not this long wait. There's not all this back getting like articling done and all that stuff like that. Nothing like that has to happen anymore because it just gets processed. All the, all the data is there and it's all existed. It's all verified. Right. So it's just this like processing thing and then it gets done. So literally clients, like everybody's suing everybody in litigation. As soon as they've stepped outside of a thing, it's just like you press a button and it's done. <laughs> right mm. and then sentence happens so like they got a bad litigation at work uh thing and then uh there's a cyber security breach and what we'll, we're gonna hopefully pull on a cyber security uh expert here at one point to talk about what that breach looks like and how how that happens right now um and then we're gonna talk ab- and then like he has another client who's pissed off they're about to start a litigation process again because of the security breach and stuff like, and then he gets a call from, um, you know, or a call. He doesn't get a call. No one calls anymore. Uh, he gets a notification that, um, the child has been skipping his learnings, right? They don't go to school anymore. It's been skipping his learnings and like, like all this stuff's adding up. He's skipped all these sleep cycles and boom this moment happens and it's his health is now at risk. He stretched his body too far. Does the system oust him at that point? Yeah. Uh, No, 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 no. He accepts the prescription. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. No, this is where it gets funny. Adam, I'll let you take over. And keep in mind, Adam, we have literally five minutes and it will be the summary of the episode. No pressure, bud. It's all on your shoulders. Everything. See, I finish did, I strong. Did, you got to finish strong, bud. Okay. Well, here, here's the like one minute, kind of as far as, as far as we've gotten. So, if you are pulled out of the system or the healthcare is notified that you're kind of being a pain in the ass, then you are transported to a reset facility, and there you go. So they send a transport vehicle, and they grab you, and they take you there until they're confident that you are not going to be a leg on the system, and then they send you back. Right. So in the meantime. Probably something along the lines of, you know, maybe some kind of buffers or security put on your, how you're plugged in or whatever. But then we, we summarized how the security of the future would be blockchain. So it's like the, how information connects, right? And that if you wanted to steal something, piracy would essentially be breaking into something blockchain and swapping out ones and zeros so that the system doesn't know, say, for example, if a cargo craft gets removed and replaced with something else you never know that's how you steal something in the future so oh i love it i love it right so (laughs) the poor guy is being transported to resets through um on some kind of transport vessel right and uh, along comes some pirate that you know hacks in and steals the vehicle without knowing there's a person inside um whatever ones and zeros hacks it all and then that's kind of where the story goes from there that's kind of how he gets pulled from the system and deleted. And because they're messing around with the blockchain, as far as the system in the world is concerned, he's at the reset uh, facility because that's what the system tells him. So no, so that's kind of how we've kind of mapped out what's going to happen to set this whole thing off. Okay, so no, no one gets an alert until he's supposed to return. And then in the process, like no one gets an alert. So he's now stuck. Unplugged. So, Adam, I know this is perfect, but I want to answer one question. I have to, we, it doesn't matter if we go over, because I think yeah. this is brilliant. I think it's really great. 
Yay, my, my, got yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got one fan, anyways, right? So okay, so you've got this, you got this blockchain kind of concept, right? And mm -hmm. what I, I think that the idea of the ones and zeros as like Lego blocks that you're plugging into like missing gaps is really interesting, especially you're introducing like some tension in there and some like uh, and a way to game the system sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what I what I think would be really great on how we tell this narrative is that we discovered that this was the only way to keep the system complex enough. You know, you, you, you've heard these stories about setting up an artificial environment, like an artificial space environment, and they've yeah. collapsed. And it's like, I wonder if it just doesn't have a level of complexity that just kind of like keeping, um, like, it's like the programmer's intentionally allow the system to have like little Lego blocks of like uh, gamifying, right? Mm -hmm. Our ability to fuck with the system basically is that <laughs> what keeps it strong. It's just managed. It's just not like, do you know right. what I mean? There's a certain amount of whatever imperfection. Unstability that, that is actually like it, purposely it allowed to, fill, to flow in, right? Well, Otherwise, the matrix again coming out. <laughs> what's that? That's, there's the matrix again, right? The, the the premise of uh, the one or whatever you know is that the machines allow it because the perfect system they created crashed because nobody would accept it so they had to create an imperfect system a shit show essentially and then be like okay I, I can live here <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly I get buy in because it's somehow it's not perfect it can't be perfect yeah. it has to have an ability to yeah. breathe you know kind of thing yeah okay Early cool point. I like it. I like it. Forget and we explain that. a way because I mean I don't want to have like the you know the um, you know the Bitcoin expert or the you know the, you know the, the physicist that comes in to say well that's an easy algorithm to fix. Of course we can do a rigid system, and of course it would be unhackable to the level of like atomic calculation. There's no you know I don't know something silly like that. But we say no, it was intentionally planned. It's like oh, okay, I get it. Right, Adam makes the rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say that the system that kind of grew, it evolved, right? It wasn't perfectly planned. Yeah. It kind of went piece by piece by piece by piece by piece by piece. And yeah, there's parts of it, there's background, there's dark web, there's, you know, there's places to play by those who are trying to game the system. And yeah. that's where we want to kind of talk about it. Kate, so. one final, see, I, I thought I was going to end with Adam, but I'm going to end with Kate, and then that's it. Um, All the pressure. Uh, my final thoughts is that uh, we, we are playing a lot in the what ifs of the technology and the physics and all that stuff. Um, but the real journey is about humanity. And so there's going to be a point where we need to say, yeah, here's the world, here's how it's working, and here's the premise of it. But this journey, of the, the inner transformation is the story that matters. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's great, guys. All right. Okay, let's sign off. Thanks for coming. Until next time. Back to the future. You bet. Bye now.